In, uh, in Romans chapter 6, verses 15 through 18, the Apostle Paul writes, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So as I was considering what to share tonight, I thought, of simply sharing my testimony. There's a reason for it. As mentioned a moment ago, we're putting together a packet and all. But tomorrow marks my, my anniversary, my spiritual birthday. Tomorrow, December 27th, I'll celebrate 48 years of walking with Jesus Christ. And so I wanted to share a little bit about what led to that in my life. And I appreciate your, your, your applause. I, it makes me feel so good. I do appreciate that. Thank you so much for caring. Yeah, I've only given my testimony as I'm going to do tonight twice in 48 years. The very first message I ever gave behind a pulpit when I was um, 20, uh, 29 years old uh, was my testimony. That's the first time I ever really gave my testimony. And, and a few years ago, I gave my testimony. Somebody had asked me to teach and give my testimony, and that's what I did. So I've, been te I've never really given my testimony, though you're, you're going to recognize it, but I've never done it like this outside of two other times. And so I wanted to share with you my testimony. Uh, as I begin, let me, let me state this. Somebody says, well, what's a testimony? The word testimony uh, can be defined in various ways. A testimony is a statement or declaration of a witness under oath or affirmation, usually in court. You know, they give their testimony. A testimony is also used as evidence in support of a fact or statement. It's proof. Or, as in my case, a testimony is an open declaration or profession of faith. And so I want to share an open declaration or profession of my faith. Now you might say, why would you want to do that? Well, Paul felt that giving testimony was a great way of communicating faith in Jesus Christ. When you read your Bible you'll discover that on many occasions, Scripture records him sharing his personal testimony. He gives his testimony in the book of Acts in chapter 22, in Acts chapter 26, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 through 17, in the book of Galatians chapters 1 and 2, in Philippians chapter 3, they all give insights into his conversion. And so he wanted to give his testimony because it gives glory to God. You see, the purpose of giving testimony is to bring praise and glory to Jesus Christ, our Savior. As it says in Psalm 22, verse 22, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you among your assembled people. And that's what a testimony is. It's to give praise to God in front of people. So I want to give an open declaration of my faith in Jesus Christ. Now, I'm a little concerned because when I give my testimony, I have a tendency, and I don't like, that's part of the reason why I don't like to talk about it, is I have a tendency of not, not simply giving facts, but as I'm speaking, my emotions go back to the event. And, and I don't like that about myself, but it's just true. If I start speaking about something, not only am I talking about the details, but I begin to feel what I was feeling at that time. So in advance, I'm going to tear up. I've already asked the Lord, please no, but he, he doesn't answer all my prayers, and so he usually does. He says, I'll do what I want. But I, 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 I'm, just, I'm just warning you in advance. So here we go. I was born in 1950 in Whittier, California. Um, my father and my mother were first-generation Americans. I'm supposed to, yeah, there they are. I knew it.
See? That's why I don't give my testimony. They were, they were first-generation Americans born to Mexican immigrants. My family on my father's side came to the United States in the early 1900s and uh, my, my father's father was from a, a town called Queretaro, uh, north of Mexico City. And uh, my mom's parents came from uh, Jalisco. From, her mama was from Los Altos, from what I understand. And so they both emigrated legally, <laughs> I should say, into the United States. <laughs> in the early 1900s. And uh, I, my dad was born in L.A. My mom was born in Whittier. I was uh, born in Whittier, lived my first year of my life in Los Angeles. And my dad bought a house in the city of Norwalk in 1951. My father wasn't a religious man. My mom had deep religious feelings. At four months of age, she took me to be baptized at La Placita Church in Los Angeles in Alvera Street, right there. That's where I was baptized in December of 1950. Um, and though my mom didn't go to church the way that she would have liked to, you see, my father, not being a religious man, didn't like religion and didn't like the Bible because the only person he ever knew who read the Bible was, was to, in his way of thinking, was crazy. So my father wouldn't allow my mom to read the Bible. But my mom, being my mom, decided that if she wanted to do it, well, that was one thing she'd disobey him with. And so she had her little Bible that she would hide from my dad. And so she wanted to be a, uh, a religious person because she wanted to be good. And so that's why at the age of of uh, four months, she took me to this small church, and that's why she had me baptized. Um, there was one thing that my mom tried to teach me as a little boy that I've carried in throughout my whole life, and that was to pray. She was, she was somebody who believed in prayer. Though she didn't have a relationship with God, she did believe that there is a God who does listen. And so she tried to teach me how to pray, and I can still remember the first prayer that I ever said out loud. I still remember it. I was four years old. Um, my mom was bathing my sister Madeline, who was probably around a year or so old. I, I was probably four or five at that time. And at that time, I don't know if it's still true today, but then uh, often the babies could be or would be bathed in the kitchen. And my mom would close the uh, sliding doors and things and turn on the oven to warm up the room, and um, that's where she would bathe Madeline because it was warm in there, and I can still remember she had that little pocket door closed. My brother Frank and I were playing in, uh, in the front room when the, there was a sound of something crashing on the ground, and then the pocket door began to move, to vibrate. You could hear it rattling, and I opened it up. I was about four or five, and I opened it up, and when I opened, slid open that pocket door, my mother's body fell into the room. And uh, she was having an epileptic seizure. And she was lying between me and my sister Madeline. And I was afraid to get close to my mom because I didn't know what was going on. But I was afraid my sister was going to slide off the sink because she was on the sink, a little baby, a years old, year old. And I remember pressing my shoulders against the, uh, the wall of the, as my mom was at my feet, and I remember praying, God, don't let my mother die. That's the first prayer I can remember praying. I was probably a little bit less than five years old. My brother ran across the street, got a neighbor who came and helped my mom, and that was the beginning of illnesses that my mother had until the day she died. What that did in me is it developed a fear that my mother could die at any time. And she had epilepsy, and it became one of a series of illnesses that she suffered throughout her young life. 
My mom began to have illnesses when she was around 24 years old and never, never healed uh, ever. For all those years, over 60 years, my mom was one sick woman. And as a little kid, my mom was hospitalized on a few occasions, and I began to fear that she wasn't going to come home. When I was about six years old, uh, my mom was in the hospital again, and I, remember, I, I still remember crying myself to sleep. And my father walked into the room, and he said to me, what are you crying about? Now, my dad was one of these uh, men of his generation. He had very little emotion, would show very little tenderness of any sort. It was real rough. My father's voice was real rough, as I recall, when I was little. And he came walking in, and he said, what are you crying about? And I said, my mom, mama's in the hospital, and I miss her, and I was crying. And, he, and I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, if you're a good boy, she will get well. And so when he told me that at that age, I was baby, maybe around six years old, less than seven, I, I tried to be good. And at that age, I did the very best I could do to become a good person so my mom wouldn't get sick. So I became a very good student. I remember in, in the second grade, um, I don't know how they uh, hand out the um, report cards today. They're different than when we went to school, those who are in my age category. You used to get about 30 grades. Um, you, had, you remember that? Some of you, you remember you had about 30 grades. So I wanted to be the best I could be. I got 29 A's and a B plus, And I was upset about the B plus. You know, I wanted straight A's. I, I was a perfectionist. I was going to be the best that I could be so that my mom would get well. And so I remember that. I remember getting upset and all of that, trying to become a very good person. I became very religious. I, 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 uh, at the age of seven or eight, I received my first communion. Uh, when I was 12 or 13, I received my confirmation. Now, at the age of seven, my mom suffered severe depression, and my mother became abusive, and my mother became suicidal. I still remember, couldn't have been more than eight years old, that my dad and mom and my brother and I were in the car, and we pulled up to a, like a precipice, to a cliff, and my dad and mom walked out, and they were standing on the edge of a cliff, and my mom comes walking in and climbs into the car, and she turns to me and my brother, and she says, I almost jumped, but your father kept me from jumping. That's what I lived with. That's what I thought every day. I would run home from school every day. See, I don't like to remember. Sometimes she'd be on the ground having a seizure. I was seven years old, eight years old, nine years old, and I was getting alcohol and rubbing it on her and holding her. I didn't have a childhood. I was trying to be the man, take care of my family, take care of my mom. Then I had to take care of my sisters. I don't even remember what my older brother did at that time, but I think he found ways to bail pretty early, and it was left on my shoulders to try and take care of my family. And my mom began to drink on occasion. And when she would drink, she would get, she'd go into rages. She would scream, and she would lash out at the smallest things. And when she would drink, and that alcohol would be mixed with her meds, she'd have anger. And I can still remember those times that she would get so angry and so violent. One Christmas, we didn't get gifts. As a matter of fact, we didn't get them for a while. My dad was working two jobs to try and pay for my mom's medical bills. And so we didn't get Christmas gifts. We didn't get a tree or anything like that. You know, I was real embarrassed about that. I can still remember my friends had the trees and all of that, but... We got what we called a Charlie Brown, if anything. And usually it would be like the last day or two before Christmas, and they gave them away at the lots. It wasn't because my dad was poor. He, 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 he wasn't that he was poor. It was that all of his money was going to medical bills. And so we just didn't expect anything. But I do remember one Christmas, I was 
probably about eight or nine, we got gifts. And uh, I was so excited about it that I went into the, I looked in the room where the gifts had been wrapped just to just to see them. And my mom found out, and she got so mad at me, she threw me on the ground and kicked me and began screaming at me how much she hated me. Kind of took the sparkle up Christmas for a, an eight-year-old. So I began to question, what is love? If the one you love the most, your mom, does that, then what is love? Then what is love? So I began to wonder, what does it mean to love? And I didn't trust anybody. And if somebody said that they loved me, I never believed it. Never did. My dad seemed to be unaware of what was going on. And so the more he withdrew, I withdrew. So my mom eventually started working to keep from being with us and hurting us. And I began to grow lonely. Eventually, I just got tired of the anger and the hurt going on. And at about 15, I began to drink. And at that time, I began to believe that if I had a girlfriend, I could be emotionally healthy. I began falling in love with anybody I thought could love me. None really did. So at 15, I began to drink. At 16, I began smoking pot. At 17, I exper experimented with LSD, started using magic mushrooms, THC. We used to smoke something called keef, hash. I started dropping whites and yellow jackets and reds. But alcohol was easier to get because I would steal it. Or I'd get somebody to score some wine or some beer. And I began to steal, mostly clothing, but also I would go into stores and steal alcohol. At that time, I was a child of the 60s. Music was more than something I enjoyed. It actually set a tone for what I wanted to become. As a California guy, the Beach Boys established my picture of girls and relationships. And so I liked songs like Surfer Girl and California Girls, I Get Around, Don't Worry Baby, Help Me Rhonda, When I Grow Up. Wouldn't it be nice? God only knows. Those are the things that I would listen to. I like the song 409 too because I like fast cars. I began to mix that music with the British invasion, then psychedelic rock, then heavy metal. I know that anybody who knows me at my age, you think, you know, you're just an old goat. But I was a headbanger. You wouldn't believe it, but I, I, I liked, I liked uh, psychedelic rock a lot, Led Zeppelin. And the cream, the cream, whom, the who, um, the animals, yard birds, stones, uh, Bob Dylan, the birds, Buffalo Springfield, Simon and Garfunkel, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, Janis Joplin, Santana, Jefferson Airplane. They were all groups that I liked. I especially was influenced by the Moody Blues, and the Beatles. The Beatles were more than than just a musical group to me. They were for profits. I actually listened to the things they had to say, thinking that they had the keys to life. And so they became very big in my life. Around that time, at 16, I, was, I got arrested for being a drunk. I was drunk in public. They threw me in jail on Washington's birthday. At age 18, I stole some whiskey and burglarized a jewelry store. Got arrested. My dad got a lawyer, Stanley H. Brown. I still remember him, and he remembered me for a long time because he would send me Christmas cards hoping that I was in trouble again <laughs> and we could hire him. <laughs> My dad hawked his house. He actually got a second on his home to get this Beverly Hills lawyer to keep me from going to jail because of the crime that I had committed. I could have gone to prison for it. At age 19, I got arrested for drunk in public again, and my dad sent me to a, psychology, a psychologist. As this is all going on, all the drinking, all the partying, all the drug taking, my friends began to die. I had gone to funerals. My cousin, I had a cousin named Richie, and Richie, uh, Richie lived in, in Venice, not in the nice area of Venice. Um, there was a time when Culver City in Venice wasn't a place that you thought was a nice place to go. Some of you may know that. It was a rough place, and I had cousins that, if they didn't know it was me, I could very well have gotten shot just going to see my aunt. 
I mean, they were rough people. They were rough people. And so my, my, my cousin Richie died of a heroin overdose when I was 12 years old. And they found his, his body in a field, and it had been consumed by ants. And so it was a closed casket funeral. And so now I'm starting to see relatives and now friends. I had a friend named Dave Smith. Dave and I used to party a lot together. And Dave was on his motorcycle and he was driving under the influence of alcohol, uh, acid, and reds. And he drove his motorcycle into the back of a, a parked truck and hit it face first and had a closed casket funeral. I had a guy that, uh, I don't even remember his name, but I used to party with this guy. And, and, and when I was 19, I used to be uh, working for a, a florist, and I would deliver flowers and funeral wreaths, and I had to go to, um, excuse me, to um, um, Rose Hills. And I went in, and I read the card of the wreath because I had to place it on the casket, and it said this kid's name, and I thought, I know someone by that name, and I'll never forget the shock I felt when I placed the wreath on the casket and looked into the face of a guy I had been partying with just a couple weeks before he had died of a drug overdose. I had a friend named Billy, Billy Coger. Billy Coger was at a Tasty Freeze just hanging around. He got stabbed to death. The one that hit me the, the worst was my friend Ray Casada. Ray and I had been friends since we were five years old. And... Uh, he was very dear to me in very many ways. He was a guy that my mom didn't like me hanging around because Ray was always in trouble, always doing something wrong, which is why I liked him. We were so much alike. He had an alias. His name was Augustus Romero. His real name was Ray Casada, but his, his alias was Augustus Romero. And so I had an alias. Mine was Don Johnson. I thought I look more white than Mexican, so I'll be <laughs> Don Johnson. <laughs> But Ray was very dear to me. I could tell you stories about him, how he came knocking on the door one day and said, Dave, let's go. We're going for a ride. And I said, who's got a car? We're only 15. He says, well, we went down the street and we borrowed one. And they had. They had gone to the International Harvester, which was just up the street, and they had found some keys, and they pulled out in this big suburban-like harvester. And all, all, not one of us knew how to drive. And there were six of us in this thing driving through the neighborhood. We used to do crazy things like that. All the time. We used to go to Stanley Chevrolet. You know Stanley, Stanley, Stanley Chevrolet? You know, two blocks off the Santa Ana Freeway, 11980 East Firestone, Stanley Chevrolet. <laughs> you remember that one? <laughs> we used to go to Stanley Chevrolet, and they used to leave the keys in the cars. Some of you might remember that. They used to leave the keys in the cars, and we would find them the furthest from the, from the office, and we'd climb in those cars, we'd turn them on, We'd put, our, the, put the brake on, drop it into drive. We'd rev it up until we were smoking the tires. And then we'd just watch all the salesmen come running out to chase us down the street. That's what we would do during the summer. We had a lot of fun and never got caught. My mama didn't like me hanging around with Ray, and I just don't know why. It was because he had all those ideas. That's the way he was. Ray and I were very good friends from the time we were in kindergarten. And now we were in high school. And... And Ray was across the street from my house. It was a party. And my mom had said to me, Son, I don't want you to go to that party. Please don't go to that party. I have a bad feeling. And for, you know, once I obeyed her and I went to visit some other friends when I got a call from my mom, she said, Ray was shot tonight. And what had happened is Ray had gone to that party. And when Ray went to that party, there was a guy named Pete that he and Pete had a running beef, running conflict. They're, they fought more than once. They did not like each other. Pete showed up at the party. There they go. My friend Mikey, Mikey Torres, another kid that I grew up with in the neighborhood, Mikey saw Pete was there, and Mikey went a couple blocks home, got his gun, and came back. And when he came back, Ray and Pete started to have a fight in the International Harvester's parking lot, and Mikey leveled to shoot, to shoot Pete. And when he leveled and fired, Ray dove at Pete to take him down, and he got shot in the head. And the next day, my friend Bill and I and some of the kids went to Studebaker Hospital, and 
we climbed on each other's shoulders and looked into the ICU. And I saw my friend Ray hooked up with all of these tubes. And he died in a couple of days. And that started to hit me. I started seeing friends dying. And um, one day I was at a pastor's conference. And a young man approaches me. And he says to me, David, he said, uh, I'm an assistant pastor at a church in La Habra. He says, but I wanted to ask you, did you grow up in Norwalk? And I said, yeah, I did. He said, uh, did you have a friend named Ray Casala? And I said, yeah, he was one of my very best friends. He said, did you know a guy named Mikey? Mikey Torres? I said, yeah, Mikey shot Ray. Yeah, I, I, know, I know Mikey. Yeah, grew up with him. He goes, that's my dad. That's my dad. He said, I heard you sharing on the radio about Mikey. He said, and that's my dad. And I want you to know that my dad got saved. Now, Mikey, the one who shot my friend Ray, Mikey spent 30-some years behind bars. 30-some years behind bars. And uh, one day I was teaching here at a men's conference, and here comes this this guy, and they say, someone wants to talk to you. And I walk down there, and there's this guy standing. He's got, you know, the tats, the whole nine yards, just kind of standing. And he says, it is you, like that. I'll never forget that. It is you. He goes, you got blue eyes. It's you. And I said, yeah. He goes, it's Mikey, man. How you doing? And Mikey is serving the Lord now with his son in a Calvary into the Light ministry uh, in La Habra. So it, you know, but he's the one, and, and I mean, we're, we're, he's still very dear to me, and um, he, he accidentally shot his best friend. When that happened, it made me start thinking about death, because I was getting crazier and crazier. I, I, was, I was with a friend of mine named Angel, and we were together uh, with a couple guys I didn't know in the back seat of my Volkswagen, and uh, we had pulled over because we thought a party that was going on was um, that, that our friends were there. And so, so my, my friend Angel opens, dro rolls down the window and these two girls were walking by and he, he, he wanted to ask them about the party, but they got smart with him and they said things to him. And so he got mad and uh, we, we, some guys came out and before you know it, they're throwing beer in his face and they threw a bottle at my car and you know, I, I said, we don't want any beef with you, man. We just, you know, so we were driving away, and, the, and that got me upset. So we went up on Pioneer Boulevard in Norwalk. Any of you guys are familiar? There's, a, there's a, some apartments that are on Pioneer by the, by the park, and, and we went into a, uh, a party. There were the Majestics, a car club was having a party there, and we got seven carloads of guys, and we went back to the party. And when we went back to the party, we found the guy who was starting the trouble, one of the guys, and my friend... Angel started to fight with him. And when Angel started fighting with him, some guy I didn't know said, Angel, I still remember this. And, and he had a switchblade and he, and he opened it up and put it in Angel's hand and Angel stabbed the guy right in the lower chest. And the guy started to bleed and the guy grabbed hold of me and started, you know, crying and stuff and, and blood was, and I shoved him and it got crazy. It got crazy. And, and I went home, and my brother looks at me, and I've got blood on my T-shirt, and he says, what are you doing? What's happening to you, David? What happened to you? And I said, I don't want to talk about it. But I was starting to spiral. I was starting to go down. I'm seeing friends die. I'm starting to be places I shouldn't be. And then right around that same time, I almost died. I, I, I took five reds, barbiturates, and I drank uh, over a quart of wine, and uh, I, almost, I almost OD'd. I was laying in the back of my car. I was about 18, 19 years old, and I started to want to vomit, and that's a sign of barbiturate poisoning, and I knew it, and I was paralyzed. I couldn't move, and I remember that's the first time that I remember praying, saying, God, help me. I'm too young to die. And so that was going on all at this time. It was getting crazy and everything. Um, you can see a picture of me in the hallway. I think we might have it here. That's me at that time. 
that that in my left hand is uh, I think that's either gin or rum, and you can't see my mouth, but I have a joint in my mouth, and uh, flash in the peace sign because yeah, peace is all of that, right? And that's in front of my parents' house. I mean, I didn't hide it. I mean, and the neighbors knew that I was a doper and a drunk. And it was one of those things like, so what? If you don't like it, who cares? You know, that was the way I was at that time. And I started getting worse. Right around that time, uh, in 1969, I got drafted. They had what they called the draft lottery. I never won anything, but I won that. (laughs) And so I was supposed to be inducted into the military on August 25th. And um, it was 1970. I, I was, yeah, August 25th, 1970. My birthday's August 23rd. I have a friend who was born the 24th, and another friend the 25th. So we combined our birth dates, and we got loaded and drunk with a lot of people all night. And um, I came home at, at 3 in the morning, and then at 6 I got up to be taken to the induction center in L.A. And my mom and my dad and my two sisters were in the kitchen when I walked in and my dad had his arms folded. My mom was crying. My sisters were crying. And my mom says, why couldn't you come home? Your brother stayed home when he went into the Navy. Why didn't you stay home? And I said, you don't have anything to worry about. I'll be gone. You won't see me again for a couple of years. I'll be out of here. What's the big deal? And so my dad was so disgusted with me, he put me in his car and drove me to the induction center. But because I had been arrested for, for that burglary charge, even though it had been uh, dismissed, I came home. And when I came home, I started getting even worse. Uh, I threw a uh, two- or three-day party at my house while my parents were on vacation. They came home, and I had to take off for a while, and I was just going down the tube. I was taking so much drugs and drinking so much that in a month I dropped, uh, I dropped 30 pounds because I wasn't eating. I was just drinking and smoking dope and just partying and going down. So in September of 70, I went to Monterey for the Monterey Music Festival, and I dropped Magic Mushroom and was smoking pot for the weekend. And I remember seeing a young couple with a small child. They were all dressed up in clothing that they had made out of bed sheets. And it hit me, that's my future. If I don't get it together, I'm just going to be, I'm just going to be without anything. And I was there listening to the Moody Blues, and I was smoking pot, and I was in Pacific Grove, and I was thinking, what am I going to do with my life? Because something's got to change. I'm messed up. And around that time, my, a friend of mine invited me to go to church. I didn't want to go. So I, I went to my parish priest because I was raised Catholic. So I, I, if I'm going to get counsel from anybody, it's going to be a priest. And so I went to my parish priest at, uh, in Santa Fe Springs, St. Pius X Church, and I made an appointment to speak to the priest. And I remember walking in, and I said, I got a friend who's all weird. He's a Protestant, and he's telling me I need to receive Christ as my Savior. But I told him that he's, 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 he's wrong but I need your answers to give to this guy. Can you help me? Because I want to argue with him because I know Catholicism's the right way. You see, I I knew that I was going to marry a good Catholic woman. She was going to pray my soul out of purgatory. I had it all down, you know, and so I said, you know, you got to give me answers. And I'll never forget that priest looking at me and kind of folding his arms and saying, well, you know, he goes, I I, I tried Eastern religion, and I tried other things. He said, I came back to Catholicism, so will you. So I walked out of that room there. I was about, about, about 20 then. And I said, and this was my response. I said, he doesn't know God. If he knew God, he'd be trying to convince me to know God the way my friend is. And that started, I started thinking about that. If he knew God, he'd be talking about Jesus. And so... My friend Bill once again says, you got to go with me to church. And so I went. I went to Calvary Chapel. Do we have that picture of the church? And that's what it looked like when I went. That was a small chapel there. You see all the kids on the floor everywhere. There was no, there was, there's, there's no seats. You, you, you actually use the person in, in behind you. You use their knees as your backrest. That's how it was. And they would fill that place up. And 
that was the first, this isn't a picture of the first time, but I went when it was like that. And I, I remember walking in and all of these hippie kids and, and I, had, I had smoked some pot, I had drank some beer, I was barefoot, I was long hair. Um, I was sure I was going to get kicked out. And, and when I walked in, I, I was very surprised. I had never felt what I felt there. Again, it was love. It was the purity of the love of God. I, I, I felt that. I sensed it. Well, I, as I mentioned, I had been drafted. I was supposed to be appearing for induction because they started sending me notices. And every month I'd write back and say, I'm sorry, I can't make it. Because you could do that at that time. So I got a doctor's appointment. You know, I've got to go to the DMV. Or I, you could do that. So I became a pen pal with, uh, with somebody who wrote me several, every month, you are hereby ordered for induction. And I'd write, sorry, I can't do it. My foot hurts. You know, and I was doing that. <laughs> and I finally said, um, I got to do something about this. Because, again, in December... I was invited to go to a Christian concert in Hollywood at the Hollywood Palladium. And that's the kind of concert that I went to. That is a picture of one of the concerts at the Hollywood Palladium. And I went to that Christian concert. And uh, I tried to get out of it. Uh, I didn't want to go. I had a friend who was receiving a, a kilo of marijuana from, uh, from Thailand. And... Um, at that time, you know, that was, that was the stuff you wanted. And so, and it was free. So, if it's free, it's for me. And so I, I, so I went to my friend Bill's house and I said, you know, man, I, I can't come. I know I promised that I'd go with you, but I can't. And, and he had his, his van parked behind my car and, and I was waiting in the car for them to move. And I saw all these heads go down. Then they all came back up. And he climbed out and taps on my window and he says, we prayed and told God that we want you to go. And God said, you have to go. So you have to turn your car off and you have to come with us. And I figured, you know, if God told him that, you know, he must be serious. You know, I, <laughs> so I turned my car off. I did. And I climbed into the van with them and off I went to the Hollywood Palladium. And, uh, and at that, con there was a concert and there was preaching and and I still remember them singing this song, love, 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 love. Christians, this is your call. Love your neighbor as yourself because God loves all. And again, you got to remember the one thing I didn't have was that. The one thing I didn't have was that. And I heard them singing. And I remember standing with my hands in my pockets, feeling like I, I don't belong here. And I had my hands in my pockets. And my friend George Adams and a young lady named Lori were right behind me. And, Ad, and George said to me, Dave, and I turned around and they opened a space between them and welcomed me and I put my arm around their shoulders and I didn't know the song. I just knew that something was going on. And so an evangelist named Arthur Blessed came up and he gave a message. And at the end of the message, he said, if you need Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, stand to your feet. And I said, God, I'm so uncomfortable here. And the Lord has spoken in my heart. Why are you uncomfortable? I said, I'm not like these people. Well, what makes you different? I'm not a Christian. That was the first time I even admitted to myself. I thought I was speaking to myself. It was conviction of the Spirit. But I said, I'm not a Christian. And so when Arthur Blessed said, if you need the Lord Jesus to forgive you of your sins, to cleanse you and give you a new life, because I had started at that time praying, and I started saying to God, I can't do this anymore. I, I've hurt too many people. You know, I can't tell you all of my, my story. You don't want to hear it, but I wouldn't want to tell it. It just, I was just not a good person. Just not a good person. Filled with anger. Filled with hate. Filled with bitterness. Just, and I knew it. I was over. I was hurting people all the time. I was stealing from friends. I just, I hated what I was doing, but I didn't know a way to get out of it. 
and, and, and now I'm sensing something and I finally say, I'm not a Christian. And that's when Arthur Blessed said, if you want the Lord to come into your life, stand to your feet. And I prayed and I said, God, I, I need you. I know I need to become a Christian. I know I need you, but I'm shy. I can't stand in front of anybody. But if somebody would, would stand with me, I would stand. And that's when Arthur Blessed said, if, if you're afraid, perhaps you're afraid to stand up by yourself. But if somebody would stand with you, would you stand? And my friend George tapped me on the shoulder and he said, I'll stand with you. And that's how I got saved. I stood up December 27th, 1970, and gave my heart to Jesus Christ. And I have stood for him ever since. I want to close with a couple of thoughts here. What can God do with a broken life? I went out, and that night I witnessed to my friend's mom, to my friend's younger brothers and sisters. I went home. I walked into my parents' den. I said to them, and mom and dad, my two sisters, I love you. Praise the Lord. My sister Madeline came and asked me, what happened to you? And I said, I gave my heart to Christ tonight. And my sister Madeline went to her bed that night, and she said, whatever you did for David, God, please do it for me. And she got saved that night. Three weeks later, I was reading the Bible, as you've heard me say this before. Revelation 9, you know, men with iron teeth and women's hair and scorpion stings, and I'm just, wow, what is this? But I went and spoke to my dad and mom, and I read that passage to them and said, um, I don't know what this means, but I do know this. It's not talking to me. It's talking to you. And I said to my dad, I said, Daddy, I said, you're a good man. You are the best man I will ever know, but you will be the best man in hell if you don't give your heart to Jesus Christ. I said, Daddy, I love you, and I don't want to go to heaven without you. Bow your head. You're going to receive Christ right now as your Lord and Savior. And that's when my dad put his head down and my mom put her head down and that's how they came into the kingdom. Well, I still had to go see Uncle Sam. He still wanted me to spend time with him. So I volunteered for the draft, meaning I could choose my induction date. And my friend Bill and I went into the army in, in March of 1971. My son Joseph asked what I learned in the army that helped me in ministry. And while in the service, I learned things about personal discipline, about following orders, about working as a team, of doing good for the benefit of others, and lessons like that. I was honor, honorably discharged in December of 72. And in 73, I began attending Biola College. As a Christian service assignment, I began teaching a home Bible study first in Norwalk in September of 1973. But on August 4th, 1974, my brother got saved and I began to teach a small study in his apartment. In November, a young lady named Marie attended the study. And three weeks later, she got saved. My sister Madeline led her to Christ. And then she needed discipling. <laughs> in 77, we went to a small Calvary Chapel in Claremont. In 1979, I was ordained as a minister. In 1981, I planted Calvary, Ontario, now Chino Valley. And over the last 37 years, God has done marvelous things. I was rebellious, lonely, angry, aimless, and now I'm a Christian, a husband, a father, a grandfather, a member of the Calvary Chapel Association, the council, and I have a beautiful church that I love with all of my heart. I have seen that God delights in performing his work on the platform of human, human impossibility, and it's all by his grace. It's all by his grace. Again, what then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death 
or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness.